Today is the first of two talks on Egyptian art. We think of Egyptian art as monumental, mysterious and eternal. It lasted virtually unchanged for some 3,000 years and just to put that period of time in perspective, we are closer today to the last pharaoh, Cleopatra, than she was to the time of the pyramid building. Now the Egyptians had no specific word for art as its sole purpose was to help the dead to enter and survive in the afterlife, not for it to be viewed as an end in itself. So the images and pictures we see are the embodiment of their religion and their culture. So I can't avoid talking about those as well as the art itself. So look at this um, tomb painting. This is the particular style that lasted some 3,000 years. Figures were represented, excuse me, <coughs> to show their key distinguishing features. Statues were front-facing and wall paintings like this one show important figures with their heads in profile, their torso front-facing and their feet um, one with one forward facing in the same direction as the head. Now if you look at the what's going on in the painting you might be wondering why the man on the right is piling food on a table. Well I'll be explaining more about that later. First though let's um, think about ancient Egypt and some of the key cities. The first thing you'll notice is the Nile. Runs from south to north and all of ancient Egypt occupied the narrow fertile area either side of the Nile. Now the Nile flooded annually and renewed this fertile land. It's what kept it fertile. And during the long history of Egyptian civilization, it was the flooding of the Nile producing this fertile earth, which in turn um, produced the food, enabled the civilization to survive for so long as a politically stable unit with little threat of foreign invasion. Although there were exceptions to this, what I'll talk about later. Now it was divided into upper, the upper part of the Nile, upper Egypt, and the lower part of the Egypt in the north. Starting in the south, you can see Abu Simbel, which contains the great temple of, Ra temple of Ramesses II. Further north, there is a vast temple at Karnak, uh, near Luxor, the site of the ancient city of Thebes. And on the other side of the Nile, is the Valley of the Kings, a site which for some 500 years was used to bury the pharaohs. Further north you'll see um, a city called Amarna, which today is just the remains of a capital built by Akhenaten, which I'll be talking about more in my second talk. Moving north you'll see Memphis, 12 miles south of modern-day Cairo, and on the opposite bank of the Nile, uh, Giza, which includes the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. And then finally on the Mediterranean is Alexandria, built much later by Alexander the Great. The Nile was the main means of transport, as there were few roads, and those that were tended to be washed away every year by the Nile flood. And people and goods were transported by boat up and down the Nile and fortuitously the wind blew mostly from the north. So boats could travel downstream on the current assisted by rowers and then sail back upstream using the wind. Here's a boat and um, I'm starting here at the beginning. If you heard my talk on the earliest art you'll remember that the, there's rock art in Egypt which has been dated up to 19,000 years old but the newest is of the rock art is from six to five thousand years ago and we can see a link between this rock art 
And what we see here, this is a piece of linen produced some 5,600 years ago in the pre-dynastic Egyptian period. <coughs> that is the period before the kings and pharaohs that historians have divided into dynasties. The first dynastic period started around 3000 BCE. And this is a painting from a tomb. Uh, Egyptian art, religion and culture changed little over the 3000 years except for certain periods I'll mention later. And you can see here a direct line, which is why I'm showing these three, between the prehistoric rock art to Egyptian art and later to Greek art and from there to today's Western art. So I find it exciting that we can trace a line from 20,000 years ago from figurative rock art through Egyptian art to Greek art to modern Western art. Also note on the, um, uh, the boatman on the Nile, there is writing, hieroglyphics. Writing was invented about the time of the first dynasty, about 3000 BCE. And there were two forms, hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics we see here, the sacred writing used in tombs. And there was also a hieratic a cursive script for everyday use. And the Egyptian scripts are ancestors to the majority of the scripts used today, like Latin, Cyrillic, or Arabic. Um, hieroglyphics could represent the sound or the thing pictured. And for fun, I've um, just shown you here the symbols that represent the sounds of my own name, Shafe, written phonetically. More about how we deciphered in the hieroglyphics in my second talk. But let's start at the beginning. This brings us to our first masterpiece. This is called the Nama Palette. Now, Nama was the king who effectively created Egypt by unifying Upper and Lower Egypt. And this work celebrates his victories. It's one of the earliest typical Egyptian artworks known and it contains some of the earliest hieroglyphic inscriptions ever found. It's a ceremonial device carved in siltstone, and it's based on the uh, appearance, the shape, the form of the palettes that were used for grinding cosmetics. Cosmetics were used by men and women. But this is too large for that purpose, uh, so I think it's just a um, symbolic palette. It's about two foot high and one and a half feet wide. Now, everything the Egyptians did had a religious significance, including, for example, the cosmetics. The black lined eyes that we'll see later did protect against the sun, so it was pr practical, but also it protected against the evil eye. But let's look at the palette first. Nama is on... The left. These are the two sides of the palette. So look on the left side and we'll see a pose that he's adopted, which is used again and again over the millennia. What he's doing is he's raising a mace, a club in one hand, and he's about to smash the skull of his enemy whose hair he's holding in his other hand. And he's wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. Behind him, on the left, his servant is carrying his sandals, which we can see in other artworks. Now, the bearer of the sandals was a high status position. So we think footwear was for special occasions. And Nama has his sandals carried, symbolising he is the king. Below him are the vanquished dead enemies. To his right... Um, or, or to the right of Nama is a falcon representing the god Horus perched on papyrus flowers, the symbol of Lower Egypt. 
in the falcon's talons there's a sort of rope-like object which appears to be attached to the man's nose by a hook representing the breath of life being taken from his enemy on the right the other side of the pallet we see again nama at the top left again followed by his servant carrying his sandals let me let me point to him here and this is nama this time he's wearing the red crown of lower egypt and, and in fact it's because of this nama pallet that um we believe that it was Nama who united the Upper and Lower Egypt to create a united Egypt. In front of him are four standard bearers holding banners with an animal skin, a dog and two falcons, maybe uh, representing conquered towns. On the far right here are ten beheaded corpses with their heads between the feet. And although it's difficult to see from uh, their mouths, their genitals are protruding. Below them are two beasts that are a combination of leopard and serpent, serpipards, and the round area between them here is the palate where in smaller versions of this, cosmetics would have been ground. The intertwined heads or necks could represent the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. At the bottom, there's a bull knocking down a city wall while trampling on a fallen foe. The bull symbolising strength and procreative power and is associated with the pharaohs. In fact, you can see that the Nama here is wearing, some say a lion's tail, a lion's tail or a bull's tail. And Nama's name is written at the top using the symbols here of a catfish, which was Nya, and a chisel, Mra, Nama, within a temple. So you can see that the sounds of these words, catfish and chisel, are used to represent the sounds of the king's name. <coughs> Either side are representations of the cow goddess Bat, one of the earliest deities, later combined with the goddess Hathor. And at, the, at this time, I think. Um, representing the the cosmos jumping forward about 500 years we enter the old kingdom there, there were three kingdoms the old kingdom the middle kingdom and the new kingdom and there were periods of unrest between them called intermediate periods and each kingdom is divided up into dynasties and each dynasty consists of a sequence of pharaohs. And in total, there were something like um, 33 dynasties and about 170 pharaohs, including about seven queens. Now, this, this pharaoh or king is um, Djoser, who reigned for about um, 30 years around 2650 BCE. And this is from uh, his tomb. Now his chancellor, Imhotep, was the possible or probable architect of the first pyramid. This is the step pyramid at Saqqara. Now Imhotep's reputation, possibly unfounded, was as a wise man and a healer, and his reputation grew and grew over the next 3,000 years. And he eventually became one of the few non-royals that become, became deified. 
Unfortunately, all the images we have of Imhotep date from about 2,000 years after his death, so I've, I am not showing you one because um, we, we don't know what he looked like. Now, the step pyramid is interesting. It started... We, we don't know whether it was designed originally to be a, uh, a pyramid or ended up that way, but as you can see, it um, consists of steps and each story each step is called a mastaba and the original um, tombs were like at the the first step a single uh, mastaba so what we have here is a series of smaller and smaller uh, mastabas one on top of the other that creates this stepped pyramid effect a mastaba um, was within a funeral funerary complex that typically included a serdab, which was usually in the mastaba, and that was a sealed burial chamber containing a statue of the dead that was um, thought to contain the car or life force of the deceased, and there were uh, the, the the statue was in a chamber that had holes or slits that enabled the soul to move freely and um, smell food offerings that were brought to the dead person in the outside chamber. This shows that high quality art was produced for not just the kings but also the most senior officials. Rahotep was a high official described as the son of a king, although the title might have been honorific. He was also described as the unique chief of seers at Heliopolis, chief of the hall, keeper of the Amis Scepter, eldest of the palace, and great unique one at the place of the beer measurers. I like that title. <laughs> and overseer of transporters, controller of the archers, and a physical son of the king. Now, the fact that it was written as physical son of the king does imply that it wasn't honorific, that he was actually a prince, the son of the king. He was married to Nofret, and who was described as known to the king, which means she was part of the royal entourage, part of the court, uh, perhaps because she was married to the prince. The statues, as you can see, are remarkably well preserved. Look at the detail here. They were found in 1871 in a brick mastaba. They have glass inlaid eyes, a common technique to increase the realism. And they include personal details, which in implies, we don't know, that um, this was modelled from life. And I'm thinking of um, the shape of the face, the, the details like the moustache, and the fact that the images are uh, life-sized. Idealised, but um, possibly based on their actual appearance. Another example of a, a, a non-pharaoh is and, and non-royal is uh, this seated scribe a famous work of ancient egyptian art now in the louvre it was produced around the time of Josa, or maybe a bit later during the old kingdom so it's about four and a half thousand years old and as i said before the objects and images which we now see in museums and people stand and walk around looking at them, were never really designed to be seen. They were designed as part of the... Furniture is probably the wrong word. Part, part of the, the objects placed in the tomb to assist the person in... the person who died in the afterlife. Now, the scribe had an important role to play... The scribes were high-ranking officials, and so the it would have been in the tomb 
of um, a senior person to uh, act as his scribe in the afterlife. The scribe is finely modelled. It's got realistic features. It um, uh, possibly represents a particular person, although we don't know his name, made from carved limestone, red veined and white um, magnesite eyes inlaid with rock crystals. So very, um, a, lot, a lot of detail and a lot of um, artistic skill has gone into producing the, um, the exact form of the eyes to make them uh, realistic. And the, the nipples are made of wood. He, he would have been holding a reed brush, although that's missing. He is in the middle of writing on a piece of papyrus. Scribes were some of the few who could read and write and were highly regarded and well paid. It was a high status job and the scribes were, were needed to conduct the complex administrative affairs of the country. They were used as tax collectors. Uh, they organised and administered activities like mining, trade and war. And that brings us on to the Great Pyramids of Giza. There's the... Uh, let me go through them. There's the Pyramid of Khufu on the right, which is actually... It, it's, it's further back, but it's actually the tallest of these three here or you can see six here but the three large pyramids there's the pyramid of Khafre the pyramid pyramid of Menkori and they were all produced over about a hundred year period we're in the old kingdom which lasted about 600 years and the old kingdom is also often called the age of the pyramids and the best known group of pyramids are these pyramids at Giza, north of Saqqara, near Memphis on the upper Nile and about um, 30 kilometres, 20 odd miles uh, west of modern day Cairo. The Great Pyramid, sometimes called, by the way, the Pyramid of Cheops or Khufu, and it is... Well, 100, 147 metres, 480 odd feet tall. And it was the tallest structure in the world for, well, nearly 4,000 years, 3,800 years until the building of the Eiffel Tower, which um, was overtaken uh, by the Empire State Building in 1931. Now, Khufu was a fourth dynasty pharaoh described by the Greeks as a cruel tyrant but by the ancient Egyptians as generous and pious so we don't really know the first writing on papyrus is from his reign and describes the building of the great pyramid we know quite a lot of detail now about how the pyramids were built the next but one pharaoh was his son Khafre, who built this, the pyramid in the centre here, which is slightly taller. Remember, the Great Pyramid is 480 feet. The Khafre's is 448, 450 feet. And you can see at the top, it retains some of the fine white limestone cladding, which originally clad all the pyramids and would be much um, uh, finer uh, smoother and shone in the sun like diamonds. Now, Khafre's son was probably the next pharaoh, Menkauri, and his is the, the smaller pyramid on the left, and the three very small ones in front are the pyramids of the queens. And if you're wondering, the great sphinx which I'll talk about next, is off this photograph to the right and it's connected to Khafre's uh, pyramid by a causeway. 
So they were all built during the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom between 2600 and 2500 BCE. Incidentally, they weren't built by slaves. They were built by well-paid, well-fed Egyptian craftsmen and sometimes farmers um, when they weren't active in the fields uh, as, as an act of sort of civil service. We estimate it took some 20,000 to 30,000 skilled craftsmen, well, some say 13,000 to 40,000, to build the Great Pyramid, the one in the background. Each block weighed between two and a half tonnes to 15 tonnes. They were dragged up ramps that were built for the purpose on sledges and they were lifted into place using pulleys, and all this has been demonstrated. There are something like 2.3 million stone blocks of this size, and it's also been calculated that 3,500 quarrymen would take about 27 years to produce that number of blocks, um, producing something like 250 blocks a day. The Great Sphinx of Giza. I couldn't move on without mentioning the Sphinx because it's so well known. It's uh, got a face of a human, the body of a lion. In this case, we believe the face is the Pharaoh Khafre, uh, the one with the limestone cap pyramid you just saw. So it's about four and a half thousand years old, possibly older. We believe the entire statue was originally painted bright red, yellow and blue as there are tiny paint residues still remaining on the face. By the way, its nose has been missing for at least 600 years. It wasn't blown off by Napoleon's cannons practising, as many claim. Uh, one theory is it's... Um, a Sufi Muslim mutilated it in the 14th century to protest against idolatry. It was carved out of the bedrock, which was part of the quarry used to supply some of the stones for the pyramid, the sand stones of the pyramid, although a lot of the pyramid is granite. It's estimated it took three years using a hundred workers and the... Um, the, the workers, all of the workers on the pyramid, used copper chisels. Now, you might be thinking it was a sort of amalgam of copper. They found um, some substance that made the copper a bit harder. It wasn't pure soft copper, but it was still um, a soft-ish metal compared with iron or steel. With stone hammers... You can see the whole area is um, sandstone, which is um, so. So the area around was um, effectively the quarry for some of the stones in the pyramid. Over the centuries, the Sphinx was actually covered in sand, and it was um, during the medieval period only the head was visible. And it wasn't till the 19th century that the the body was um, dug out and uncovered. The head is a bit too small for the body and there's a lot of theories why that might be. Uh, one is that as it was produced by for an earlier pharaoh and uh, later pharaohs re-carved the head to make it uh, fit their appearance and that made it smaller. Another theory that I quite like is that Originally, when the surface was higher, the head of the pyramid was effectively a, an outcrop of rock that was eroded into a head shape by the wind and sand. And so this was taken as the starting point of the Sphinx, which was then dug down into the bedrock and this outcrop of rock um, shaped into a head. This is one of the great works of the Old Kingdom. It's Menkori, remember the um, successor of Khafre, the, um, the smaller tomb, the tomb on uh, the, the pyramid on the left. 
And um, here we see him standing between two goddesses, Hathor on the left and the personification of the seventh gnome of um, Diaspolis Parva in Upper Egypt on the right. Now, just to explain, a gnome is um, the name of a district, uh, an area that was um, run by a, a governor or a mayor, if you like. Hathor was the ancient deity of many realms, mother of Horus, god of the sky, Ra, the sun god. Hathor was the goddess of beauty, sensuality, music, dancing, maternity. In, in fact, many of the, um, or most of the gods and goddesses were um, uh, represented uh, many different aspects of Egyptian life. She is typically shown wearing a headdress of cow horns with a sun disc between them. She is less well known than Isis, as Hathor wasn't exported to the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. She was popular at the time, though, a sensual goddess and playful. <laughs> in, in one story, she cheered up the god Ra by exposing her genitals. Uh, a, I was going to say a common practice, a, um, a, a, a practice that is um, uh, mentioned elsewhere in Egyptian religion and that, that ma made Ra laugh out loud, cheered him up. So the gods and goddesses could be great fun. This is the smallest of the Old Kingdom pyramids, but significant because in it was we discovered pyramid texts. These are spells for the king's afterlife and they were carved into the walls of the chamber. Let me show you. It's a bit difficult to see them clearly, but you can see uh, writing on the walls. And these funerary texts, this pyramid text, uh, were carried on by later rulers. They became what were called coffin texts. And then later they became the basis of what we call the Book of the Dead. And this, all, all of these describe... Uh, procedures and spells that assist the dead person or the spirit or I should say spirits of the dead person the ark to mix to to enter the um, afterlife and to if they passed the test to mix with the gods more of that later I'll um, explain later how each person was judged before entering paradise. Now, the, um, the pyramid texts were... Well, well, let me read a part of one of them, because that makes it clearer. Utterance, what, what's called today Utterance 373. Gather your limbs, shake the earth from your flesh, take your bread that rots not, your beer that sours not, stand at the gates that bar the common people. The, the gatekeeper comes out to you. He grasps your hand, takes you into heaven. I think at this point, I because so many things at this point are unclear, but let me introduce some of the gods to you. There were thousands of gods in ancient Egypt. Wikipedia, if you're interested, Wikipedia lists over 500 by name. But I let me just show you a few of the principal characters. And I'm showing you these because they're connected by a story. It's difficult to say who was the principal god because that depends on the period 
the region and the circumstances. They all um, had roles to play and they were all powerful in different ways rather than there being one chief god. But Osiris on the left is the lord of the underworld and judge of the dead. Now he is the uh, brother of and husband to Isis, one of the most important um, goddesses of ancient Egypt. Osiris is often shown with black or green skin, symbolising the fertile mud of the Nile. He's shown wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. The crook and flail are symbols of kingship. And Osiris and his sister wife Isis ruled during a golden age of peace and prosperity. But in due course, Osiris was murdered by his jealous brother Seth. But his sister wife Isis resurrected him and she gave birth to their child Horus. Now, after fathering Horus, Osiris departed the earth to rule the underworld and Isis hid Horus from Seth in the papyrus marshes in the reeds and raised him to avenge his father's murder. And the ongoing war between Horus and Seth takes many forms and represents, if you like, is symbolic of the battle for kingship over the earth. In one story, for example, in a fight between Horus and Seth, Horus lost an eye, but it was restored by the god Hathor. Now, his eyes, um, Horus's eyes, were associated with the sun, one of the eyes, and the moon, and the damaged eye was the explanation the Egyptians had for the phases of the moon. The death of Osiris, his resurrection, his journey to the underworld and the battles to determine who will be the chief god symbolically represents the death of a pharaoh, the pharaoh's journey to the underworld and his replacement by a new pharaoh while the pharaoh lives in the underworld with the gods. Final one I wanted to mention is Ra, or sometimes Re, R-E or R-A, was at one time the most important god associated with the sun. He has the head of a falcon surmounted by the sun's disc and one of the Egyptians' creation myths was the world was um, just water, chaotic, lifeless water, and from the water there was a pyramid-shaped mound rose and from that the sun as the sun god Ra. Now the old kingdom known as as I said the age of the pyramids finally ended about 2180 BCE and there was a period of famine and a civil war known as what we call the first intermediate period, which lasted about 125 years. It was a time of political instability, foreign invasion, and it challenged the very fabric of Egyptian society. And during the old period, as I said, Egypt was divided into provinces called gnomes. There were 42 of them, and they were ruled by um, governors that were called nomarchs. And during the first intermediate period, this period of chaos, the nomarchs, these governors, rulers of small areas, rose to power a bit like um, local warlords. And this is a scene from the tomb of one of these nomarchs called Anktifi. And he's shown here, um, I better point to, he's shown here harpoon fishing, these fish over here. And the hieroglyphics 
say, see harpooning fishes by the leader of the soldiers, the chief of the prophets, Anktifi the Excellent. At the top left, an ox has been slaughtered here. And as part of this ceremony of inspecting the fleet here, a servant is presenting Anktifi with the front right leg of an ox, known as a kipesh. So how was Egypt reunited after the chaos of the first intermediate period, this 125 year period? Mentuhotep II reunited in Egypt and became the first pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom. Mentuhotep is shown in the centre, wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, clearly incised features, a balance between image and hieroglyphics, his cartouche or his, his um, representation of his name is on the left. And, um, well, in fact, Egyptian pharaohs had five names, although typically only, well, not always, but typically only two are typically shown in the cartouche, the nomen and the pre-nomen. And he, well, here we see his nomen, the, uh, the Mentuhotep. And um, they also had a Horus name, a Nebti name, a golden Horus name and a throne name or pre-nomen and of course their personal name or nomen which was given at birth and sometimes we see the full name written and it's a sort of um, a lifetime mission statement for example uh, Mentuhotep's full name was he who unifies two lands the golden falcon lofty in plumes the lord of the rudder is Ra Montu is satisfied. By the way, the figure on the right here is the goddess Hathor, as I said, often depicted as a cow or a woman with cow's ears and the symbol of the sun. She was the daughter of Ra. And so you might be wondering, why is it been chiseled away? Well, I'll come on to this later, but during the reign of Akhenaten, when he decreed there was only one god, Aten, and he said that all other gods should be destroyed, defaced, chiselled away. After a reign of about 51 years, Mentuhotep II was buried at Deir el-Bahari, in western Thebes and the building that's there now this building was built later by Hatshepsut and the building's unusual because at first glance well to me it looks like a modern building maybe by Corbusier um, it was built on the west bank of the Nile, guarding the entrance to the Valley of the Kings. And it overwhelms the temple that I'm actually talking about, this one here. Um, if you walk up this causeway of the building, Hatshepsut's uh, temple, shown on the right here, and look to the left, you'll see Mentuhotep II's uh, temple, which is largely in ruins now. And it's not open to the public. But let's come back to where we started. Now we're talking about tombs and tomb art. Uh, we can talk about it now, I think, in a bit more detail. The This is a commemorative slab, or Stella. It shows a son on the right bringing gifts of food and drink to the tomb of his parents on the left. His father is Keti in the centre and his mother Henet on the far left smelling a lotus flower. The table is heaped with a beaker and various types of meat, vegetables, fruit and in addition the son is carrying 
the leg of an ox. So, so what's going on? Well, it was believed that the dead needed the um, presence of objects from life that they would need in the afterlife, and that included food and drink. So the living would bring food and drink and place it in the outer chamber of the serdab. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on a minute, the food would all rot. Yes, but they believe that the person's soul didn't need the physical food and drink. Their soul would extract the nourishment from the food, not it didn't need the physical substance. So when the food rotted, it would be taken away and new food would be brought in with and and the soul of the dead would extract the nourishment from that. By the way, interestingly, in the background, we can just make out the traces of the artist's grid, which aided the correct proportioning of the human figures. I won't point to it because I think it's fairly clear, this square grid in the background, which you can't often see in these paintings, um, enabled them to correctly position the figures. The figures, as I said, were are posed in the typical head in profile, shoulders and torso facing forward, feet following the head style that was used um, largely for 3,000 years. Men are typically shown in this deep red colour and women are shown uh, lighter, um, sometimes white or this or pale yellow. Interestingly, while I was researching this, I thought I'd show you this. I came across a very uh, similar image in the Art Institute of Chicago. The hieroglyphics tell us that um, this is, uh, this is not Keti. Keti is the one on the left here. The one in Chicago is Amenemhat and his wife Hemet, not Henet, Hemet, whom it says he loved. The small man up here, again carrying the leg of um, an ox, is presumably their son again, presenting them with the, the leg. And the hieroglyphics tell us that he's also called Armenem Tat, like his father. The Incidentally, the ten... Um, I, they're actually loaves, these these ten, uh, let me show you, the these things on the table are loaves of bread, but they're, um, they're lined up to look like the reeds in a field, and they called paradise the field of reeds. So maybe this is a um, symbolic way of the son hoping that his parents will reside forever, um, in the field of reeds in paradise. I don't know why the two are so similar. Maybe they were from the same workshop. Now, from the late kingdom, the late, sorry, the late old kingdom until the late middle kingdom, wooden models were used. I, I, I've said that the, um, the dead needed in the afterlife the attributes of um, the physical objects of the the world and they would place wooden models of the objects so that the um, essentially the essence of the thing could be provided for the deceased in the afterlife and in some tombs there's over uh, 30 scenes depicted in these little models there's 35 model boats, for example, in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And um, what's important, like the food, is not the outward appearance. It's not the fact that these are just small little models. It's what they represent. It's the spirit. So the spirit of a model cow becomes, in the afterlife, the cow. And it was during the Middle Kingdom that the temple complex of Karnak was started 
it was initially small. It was near the new capital of Thebes. And so various pharaohs over the years added to it until it became the main precinct with some 20 chapels and temples. And in fact, it's still one of the largest religious complexes in the world. The main temple was dedicated to Amun-Ra, guardian of Thebes, and this is a gold-plated silver figure of the god Amun-Ra. You can identify him by his beard and his headdress of a disc of the sun uh, surmounted by um, what are, are feathers, two feathers. Although the model here, the the silver figurine is small, it was seen to personify the god on earth. So it was, if you like, the represent, it was the god on earth. And it would have been in the center of one of the rooms inside the temple, would have been attended by priests and worshipped as the god on earth. Again, what is represented is what's important not the physical appearance of what you're looking at. Ra, by the way, was the creator god under one story who brought himself and the rest of the gods into being at the beginning of time. He was later fused, combined with the god Amun, which is why he's um, here called Amun Ra. And he's got blue skin, symbolising his association with the the Nile and with air and prim primeval creation and at one point um, he became the chief god of the Egyptian empire and it um, can be associated with identified with the Greek god Zeus who became the Roman god Jupiter the um, king of the head of the gods in Greek and Roman mythology. This is the Valley of the Kings in the desert west of the Nile in Lower Egypt in the south. Um, did I just say um, like in, in Upper Egypt in the south, I should have said, for 500 years from the 18th to the 20th dynasties, 65 royal tombs, we believe, were cut into the rock. The site was chosen because it's surrounded by high cliffs and so it's easily guarded. It's on the opposite bank to Thebes, near modern-day Luxor. Ramesses II is buried here, as are his sons. It was the site in 1922 of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. And it's now one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world. The, incidentally, the official name for the site in ancient times, shown here, is the Great and Majestic Necropolis of the Millions of Years of the Pharaoh Life, Strength, Health in the West of Thebes. Now, the Middle Kingdom ends with the Hykos, described as violent conquerors and oppressors of Egypt. I'm not actually sure that's true. Um, modern research indicates they were living in northern Egypt and took over when Egypt had already descended on into chaos. They were from the Levant, which... Um, includes parts of modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Jordan and the eastern part of Cyprus. And they were the first foreign rulers of Egypt during what is called the Second Intermediate Period. So I've mentioned the First Intermediate Period. So there was the New Kingdom. So, sorry, there was the Old Kingdom, the First Intermediate Period, the Middle Kingdom, and now we're on to the Second Intermediate Period, something like 1700 to 1550 BCE. Now, the Hykos 
didn't control all of Egypt, but coexisted with the um, dynasties uh, in Thebes. And this period is the first time that Egypt was ruled by foreign rulers. They um, practiced many of their own customs, the Hykos, but they also took on and practiced Egyptian customs, so they carried forward the Egyptian customs. They are credited with introducing several innovations to Egypt, such as the horse and chariot, the sickle sword, the composite bow, although some of these ideas have been disputed. They didn't produce much court art, but instead, as we see here, they um, appropriated monuments from earlier dynasties and then had their names written on them. So that um, brings us to the second intermediate period, and that brings us to the end of the early dynastic period, the um, consisting of the Old Kingdom, First Intermediate and Middle Kingdom, and the Second Intermediate, intermediate period. So my next talk in the series is the high point of Egyptian culture, the New Kingdom, which covers some 500 years, and I includes the pharaohs Akhenaten, Tutan, Kamun, and Ramesses II. So thank you for your time today. Look forward to carrying on talking to you about the New Kingdom. Goodbye for now.